So this was kind of a cool moment. Bunch for our new players uh, oh, yeah. this Thanks. year and helping them get through and, and onboard the systems. But Guardian Ranks wasn't able to solve like, okay, I understand what a mod is, but who are these people? Who are the hive? Who is, right. who is Cade 6? Everyone keeps talking about Cade 6. And so time on reflections, yeah. We're not gonna put Bife out of business anytime soon, <laughs> but getting that experience in game to be able to go look, hey, I wanna go to the timeline. I wanna read a thing, I can watch a thing. Oh, and then I can play a thing, mm. right? Like it's one thing to hear about Cade. It's another thing to play with Cade. Right. And I think that for you know a bunch of our new players, it's gonna be an exciting way to, to experience some content. Uh, and I think even some of our older players are just gonna be like, you know what I want to go do today? A little nostalgia. I want, to go, I want to go hang out with Cade 6 <laughs> in, a, in a prison. That's right. I like it. So. Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. I'm going to go ahead and show off some stuff in the background that goes over the Bungie showcase that just dropped. And also, you should note... There is no script for this video, so my apologies if things are a little bit less pristine than they usually are. Today I'm going to go ahead and talk about the Final Shape Showcase, and talk about what we saw, give you a few of my thoughts and impressions, and go over some of the important things for the narrative. So, first of all, at the very beginning of the showcase, it was confirmed, thanks to Joe Blackburn, that we are indeed going to go inside the Traveler. That's where the portal leads. Finally, we know that answer. There were tens of thousands of different theories bumbling all over the internet, and now we finally know, which is good. We can put at least a few of the rumors to rest. Nice as it is to have all of those come to an end, though, the inside of the Traveler itself looks... I'm not going to say good, and I'm not going to say bad. I'm going to say I need to see. And the reason for it is quite simply this. It's a narrative journey, and what Bungie is describing as a linear destination. So normally, destiny destinations are circular. You have several major areas that all connect in a big loop, and then you have smaller side areas that sort of act as offshoots of those areas. Here, it looks as though we start in an area such as the tower, and then slowly we progress forward in a linear fashion through the destination until we finally reach the Witnesses monolith. And whilst it does retread some of our story that we're familiar with, there's some very interesting things that happen along the way. Principally, it's going to include things like the Witness starting to exert control over the Pale Heart of the Traveler at its center, and thus changing the destination. Which, by the way, the Pale Heart is the name for the destination. This means that whilst everything starts as kind of like a copy of the Tower and a copy of some of the old destinations like the Cosmodrome and the Wall and all of that, Eventually, things will become more and more twisted the closer that we get to the Witness's stronghold. And that means that we're eventually going to start seeing architecture that changes, and a landscape that is warped, and something about it is going to start feeling wrong, as Bungie puts it. There are going to be the, I, I mean, honestly, at this point, very predictable things of, ah, I can't believe you just basically reskinned everything, which... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to entertain those comments at this current moment in time because I'm just tired of it. But, you know, it is somewhat true. But I think the interesting thing about it as well is that as we get closer to that final destination, things do ultimately start to change. And it's also not to say that they've literally just copy-pasted these things either. There are some wild visuals that we got from the trailer alone. I mean, there was something in there that looked as though it was inside the Traveler and it was just like this weird convulsing rib cage. I don't know what the heck that thing was, but that didn't look good. That looked kind of terrifying. Looked like some kind of giant monster waking up or being formed out of bones. We only got like one or two shots of it, but yeah, weird. We'll see what happens with that. Of course, also, there are new supers and things that got shown off, new enemies, but we'll talk about all of that later on, because whilst the initial trailer showed off a bunch of stuff, now we get to talk about the specifics as it was revealed in the showcase. So, when it comes to it, the reason why the Witness is at the heart of the Traveler is because of the requirements to create the final shape. For those of you who didn't tune into the seasonal story from Season of the Deep, 
Basically, the final shape is something that the Witness is able to create from the fusion of light and dark. If it has control of both powers, it's going to be able to morph the universe into whatever it desires. It's going to have the power of the conscious mind and the unconscious stuff behind it that's all involved with the darkness, and it's going to have the power of the physical world born from the light. And those two things together are going to allow it to remake the universe into a version that is more ordered and less chaotic, something which will result in the entire universe ending. Of course, we want to stop that. But this is, of course, also why the Witness is at the center of the Traveler, at the center of the Pale Heart, because there it can start to siphon the light and can therefore utilize it to destroy everything. This is where the great conflict of it all comes in, but it's also here that we note from the showcase that the campaign apparently is also about the personal story of our companions throughout this journey over the last 10 years, including the likes, of course, of Ikora, Zavala, and Cade 6. In the final shape, when we go through the portal, we find an infinite vast reality within the Pale Heart. And whilst the Witness has had time to shape it, it's also shaped by those who have been there before, such as us, such as Cade, such as the other Guardians. I say been there before, been there now. My apologies, we're doing this somewhat not live and I'm going to make mistakes. Anyway, with all of that being said, we're not the only ones here. There are new enemies, they are known as subjugators, they're the new kind of darkness enemy tied to the witness. And they are not so much like tormentors as far as the size and scope is concerned, they're a lot less Nezarek and a lot more witness. And the interesting thing about them is that they also come with deeper darkness powers. They come in a stasis and a strand flavor. And they apparently provide new definition to the combat. They can do things like freeze you and suspend you, and it means that we're going to finally have a taste of our own medicine from the strand side of things. However, this is not where it all ends, because apparently they're able to summon miniature pyramid buddies. Yeah, that... Mm. Working with them alongside a mass of Taken is going to be interesting, but it also gives us a very interesting idea of where these enemies fit into in the lore. It also gives me big Rulk vibes. Remember that Rulk's name in the lore, as given to him and his title given to him by the Worm Gods, was Subjugator. Makes me wonder if these are kind of like mini disciples, individuals forged in the Witness's will and forged in its image, ones that go out and perfectly abide by what it desires. Maybe these are individuals who have chosen its way and proven their worth. Either way, it's not clear. What is clear is that they're putting a lot of emphasis on the campaign. The campaign is something that they really wanted to nail. However, they are in a position where they knew that for the Witness's story to be properly concluded, they wanted the Witness to be at the center of the raid as well. So in the raid, apparently, we will confront the Witness. There is a few uh, interesting tidbits with this as well, because in the post show it was asked, Hey, will players who can't get into the raid need to play the raid to finish the story? And Joe Blackburn said no, which is an interesting bit of mixed messaging. It makes me wonder whether this is going to be a Dreaming City kind of thing, where perhaps finishing the raid will ultimately open up some of the final narrative beats from the destination. They do note that after the raid is complete, or rather after the campaign is complete, the whole of the Pale Heart starts to open up and it reacts to what we're doing. So a more dynamic, evolving destination similar to um, the Dreaming City is not completely out of the question, but at very least I think it's fair to say that the Witness's storyline is going to have a major story beat within the raid, and that on its own I think is good. It was also noted that they're trying to take major cues from what they did with Oryx in King's Fall and the Taken King, where the story ended technically in the raid and didn't just end in the campaign. So I think that's a really good thing. I don't know this for certain because how can I? But I imagine, given what we've been told, that the likely story presentation is going to be we go to the Witness's fortress, the monolith, and then ultimately we shut the Witness off from being able to access the light properly and defend the heart of the Traveler. And then the raid is where we actually go and kill them for good. And that is probably going to be how it is, but Following on from that moment, it's supposed to be such a massive narrative t turn in the entire story of Destiny that the whole of the universe is watching and will react to what's happening. 
so we'll see how that goes down. It's a high bar to clear, and it's an interesting one to have to jump over given what happened with Lightfall, so hopefully Final Shape has the chops for it. In the meantime though, we do have new supers. No, it is not the rumored red subclass that I don't know if that leak is even true at this point, but yeah, whatever the case. No rumored red subclass, we're getting new Arc, Solar, and Void supers. I say new, the Arc and Solar ones are very similar to what we had in D1 with Radiance and Blade Dancer, at least in terms of their aesthetic. The Solar Warlock super is kind of the callback most directly, it allows you to throw a ton of additional abilities and buff nearby allies, it's all about solar overcharging and comes with a new solar soul, you can give all of your allies weapons the scorch buff, meaning that everything can continuously explode. Apparently it's a DPS monster. No, you will not be able to self-res, they also confirmed that in the post show. Next up, we have Titans with what is known as Twilight Arsenal, which means that you can summon three Void Axes and throw them at enemies, but then when they land, you will be able to pull them up out of the ground, and your teammates will be able to do this too. You can then use these weapons. That's kind of awesome. There's also an aspect in there that gives them kind of like a shield block, which absorbs damage and then releases it as a big old burst. Hunters get a similar kind of super to Blade Dancer, except it's much more mobile. Whilst Blade Dancer, I mean, you can kind of think of it as Arc Staff, but not great. I think that you will be able to look at this in a much more dynamic light. And the reason for that is because you throw your knives, teleport to the location they land, and then deal a massive burst of damage wherever it does land. And you can throw it three times. So if you're able to do this appropriately, you'll be able to dart around the battlefield and destroy three distinct groups of adds and then return to your original position potentially. This is going to be really neat if you need to cover some distance as a hunter and yeah, some of the other supers such as say Spectral Blades or Arc Staff don't necessarily allow you to do that and cover that distance. So maybe that's the big differentiator. They also talked about new and returning exotics. And boy did they choose to lay on some goodness here. This is mainly from my nostalgia side of things, but yeah, I'm really happy with some of the returning exotics. I honestly, strangely enough, don't care that much about Kvostov. I could care less. It's, you know, it's great that it exists and for the sake of nostalgia I'm fine with it. The real bread and butter for me is Red Death. Red Death is my original favorite exotic. It was my calling card in D1 Crucible. This is the thing that put me in a very decent position with regards to the first couple of years of Destiny's PvP. Ever since I've retired, I have longed for its return because Crimson is just not the same and now, now Red Death is finally coming back. Also returning is Dragon's Breath, what is essentially the Napalm rocket launcher, literally with the coating of a dragon on the side of it. If you've never used Dragon's Breath properly, you may want to go ahead and go back to D1 if you have it. And if you used it back in the dark below, no, it's not the same. It does not launch a solar grenade anymore. They changed it so it drops a carpet of napalm-like fire and you can fire the rocket in a strange kind of arc. Releasing the trigger on it will actually cause the rocket to veer downwards into the ground. And the burst is amazing for AoE. It is such a cool weapon design. I just hope they make sure the damage on that thing's good. Of course, you also have things like a new side family of sidearms. I, I don't know how best to put it. It's a new family archetype where it fires micro rockets. That's neat. You have support for a mortar rifles that let you shoot your allies a little bit like the new navigator trace rifle and it will buff them or heal them or something. You also have a teased golden gun sniper and a traveler beam trace rifle. And the exotic that will be coming with the season pass is tessellation, which is an energy slot exotic which can fire any element. Yeah, it absorbs your grenades to make a more powerful shot, but what's crazy about this is you can actually use this to run strand and stasis in every slot. So if you are keen on making that complete loadout, you can do that. And apparently the single burst shot that it has by absorbing your grenade is really powerful too. So here's the other thing that was revealed in the notes about the campaign. Cade of course is coming back and he has been a pivotal character that apparently needed to return as a necessary part of the story to the final shape. 
It's a moment of great change for the entire universe, and Cade is there to shepherd us through it, and the heart of the Traveler. This is, well, interesting, and the wording they use to describe it is interesting too. They name him as the Virgil to guide us through the Pale Heart. This is an interesting choice of words, because of course, uh, yeah, if anybody knows where the Virgil reference as a guide is coming from, uh, yeah, you will know about the Inferno and how that is literally a tour of both the Hells and Purgatory and the Heavens, uh, and everything else that comes from it. So are we going to be touring Heaven, or are we going to be touring Hell? Or are we going to be touring the in-between? Maybe a bit of all three. Who knows? Point is, I think that wording is very specific, because it gives us a hint as to what Cade's role in this is going to be like, and a hint as to what the destination is going to be like. So, for the most part, that is most of what we got on the new stuff to do with the actual Final Shape campaign. I will say that they've made a clear point of noting that the campaign is their priority. They are trying to make it so that players who are burned from everything that happened in Lightfall will have a coherent story and that, that they land the major story beat of the Light and Dark Saga. It's a tall order. Hopefully they can do it. I will be checking it out and I know that many of you will be jumping in too. We apparently will know if they've landed it within the first few minutes. Maybe I'm misattributing that quote a little bit from Joe there. He wants us to have the sense that we've landed it within the first few minutes. I don't know if that's possible either, but we'll see. I'm cautiously optimistic is the vibe I'm getting from everyone in the community, and I think I agree. All of that being said, this isn't the only thing they revealed at the showcase. They revealed the next season. And I'll not lie, whilst I am cautiously optimistic for Final Shape, this, this got me really excited. This, at least in terms of the vibe, feels like it could be an expansion's narrative content all on its own. You want to know why? It's called Season of the Witch. We already know that our objective is to find Imaru and get him to help us resurrect Savathun so that she can tell us how to get through the portal unscathed. Here's the cool thing about it, though. We have to fight Zivorath along the way because, of course, everything with the Hive is a family affair. And in order to do this, Eris is going to transform into a hive. She is becoming the witch. And frankly, that is one of the coolest story twists I've ever seen. It feels not only like the natural progression for Eris, who previously was doing things like wielding the crown of sorrow to help us against the witness, but also it is her embracing the mantra of Destiny's universe that just because something has been bad does not mean that it integrally is bad. She has taken that and twisted it into a whole new direction, and frankly, I love it. It's so twisted. And the vibes that they've attached to this season, with literal miniature buffs that you can get via the Deck of Whispers, which is a tarot deck-esque thing throughout Destiny. Oh, it's so good. It's dripping in a cult and hive flavor, and it feels excellent. The activities, supposedly, are going to have randomized content, and it really reminds me of the kind of experiments that they were making with Deep Dive. It seems as though you'll be able to do the Spire of Savathun multiple times over and over again and have bespoke runs each time with different changing modifiers that shape things up randomly. How that works out, I don't know. As far as the actual content is concerned, I really hope that this does build on what Deep Dive did. Narratively, because that's what we're really here for. Oh my gosh. Wow. If they really wanted to turn things up to 11 and keep the Hive storyline going, this is a way to do it. Eris Morn as a Hive God is one of the coolest ideas I think I've heard of in the entirety of Destiny. And I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there too. Not only is it something where we're going to need to contend with Zivor Wrath, who's going to have one hell of a reaction to Eris becoming a Hive God, but also, we are now tithing to Eris. There is a very deliberate wording there, because tithing implies that she has taken on the similar form of tribute that Dark Hive do. However, it's something where we've been able to take and learn Hive magic and twist it with our light. So Eris seems like something completely bespoke, using some of the old lessons of the Hive. 
The coolest thing about all of this is the dynamic of it going forward. Guardians have always been one of the Hive's biggest opponents, and all of their powerful gods have been smashed against what we've been able to throw at them. Here's the thing. We just made our own Hive God, and all of that fury that we've been able to bring is now going to be tribute to Eris. I would imagine that there are some Guardians that canonically, even after this season is done, will still be in Eris's close vanguard. They will be tithing to her all the time. She is now a force to be reckoned with. She is now a force unto herself. She doesn't follow anyone's rules anymore. She has surpassed them. And as far as the narrative side of that and the potential for that story goes, man, is that going to be cool. I'm really here for this idea of Eris being the one who's able to reach into the darkest kernels of the universe, face its truest of horrors, pull out the power that's contained within, and wield it for herself. She's done it every step of the way, and I don't think this is going to be any different. There is always the constant dialogue, I even saw it yesterday and responded to a bit of it on Twitter of whether Eris is evil, and for the record, maybe this is a bad prediction for it, but I'm just going to go ahead and say no. If nothing else has been taught to us over these last few years, it has been this. Just because your enemy belongs to a certain faction does not mean that that enemy is necessarily evil. We learned it with the Cabal, we've learned it with the Fallen, it may be time to learn it again with the Hive through Eris as the medium. I would imagine that as a challenger Hive God to both Zivu Arath and Savathun, keep in mind, even though Savathun does not accept tribute in the same way anymore, she is going to be in a position where suddenly the Hive are once again split into three broods. That is a big deal. Eris is now a main stage challenger. Think about that for a second. She's kind of stepped into Oryx's shoes. Not literally, I don't think, because of course nobody claimed the power of the Taken King, but at least in terms of a power vacuum that may have been there all along. I wouldn't be surprised if Eris manages to pull Hive Guardians to her cause at some point in the future. She has that influence and that power now. I think it's entirely possible, especially considering where that goes. Whilst Bungie has confirmed that we will not be having any storylines where we're friendly with the Hive anytime soon, I imagine that if this does happen, this is the medium by which it will be set up. And it gives us a really awesome basis to work ahead of this, and to really unpack some of those characters. So, Season of the Witch. That's awesome. Really excited for that. Also, the reprised raid is Crota's End. I'll probably be covering the lore of that one more time, because as far as the narrative and lore for that raid is concerned, it is one of the best raids in all of Destiny. It is up there in the top five. I'd say that you're looking at Last Wish, King's Fall, Vow of the Disciple, and then easily Crota's End. There is just so much good stuff to cover in that raid, and I can't wait to jump into the story of it again. Honestly, there is so much. So yeah, we'll get to that when the time is right. For those of you who've not played Crota, yeah, you're in for a treat, hopefully. And they've hinted that this will be a very hard raid because of the way they've worked the reprisal. Now, some other bits and pieces. These don't necessarily immediately inform the narrative going forward, but they do help inform new players. And one of the most important ones that I want to touch on is this. Timeline Reflections. And also, I want to talk about fighting power and a few other bits and pieces going forward, but yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Timeline Reflections. This is what I want to talk about first, and this is probably one of the more important things they've done in the showcase and talked about. Basically, Destiny's entire story is really disparate, and it's cut over a bunch of different stories and expansions and seasons and everything else. So what Bungie has done is they've taken to the timeline and they've given us timeline reflections. These are key selected story missions that pull from various expansions and they have been put into the game surrounded by narrative context that is required to understand them. The idea is that if you play through all of these, you will be caught up as far as the story you need to know for everything going into final shape. Thank goodness. Hallelujah. This is what I think I've been asking for for so long, and it's a much better solution than what some people were talking about, which, 
myself included, would have just been some kind of updated, this is what happened previously cinematic, or a, hey, here's all of the cutscenes from before, have at them, watch them. And whilst it would be nice to get all the cutscenes in game again, this is a very clearly focused delivery of something. They're trying to give people a maximum efficiency delivery of content here so that they can actually get into the final shape and know what's going on. As far as what they could have delivered is concerned, I think this is the most effective way they could have done it. So yeah, I'm really glad to see this. This is awesome. If you are a new player getting into Destiny, as far as the story side of things is concerned, now I think I can actually recommend it. I can say go through the New Light stuff and then play all of the Reflection missions and then you will be caught up. That's really good. I No word on New Light being changed and overhauled again, I imagine that's still just an ongoing thing, but uh, even so, this is a major step up for players who are either new or returning. Fantastic. Other things that will help new players include the Fireteam Fighter and Fireteam Power features. So Fireteam Power basically means that now, whenever a Fireteam member is at the highest power, everyone else in that activity is bumped up to that power level as well. That's real neat, it means that if someone is super low level, they don't need to worry about it as long as they have a friend who's helping guide them through. It's going to make the world a whole lot simpler for Sherpa players as well. As for Fireteam Finder, that's basically the game's in-game LFG feature, and yeah, it's kind of neat I suppose. It's got all the typical things that you would expect, but also you can tag the kind of player that you are or that you want to play with, and that should help people connect better to the kind of players they want. As always, we will see how this performs. An in-game LFG is a nice touch, but it's also one of those things where I do remember back to guided games, of which they joked about the beta and how it would eventually be coming to an end. <laughs> yeah. Guided games did not land well at all. We'll see how this performs. I'm cautiously optimistic about this too. Hopefully it will help people get into the best content that Destiny has on offer. They also confirmed with this, by the way, because it was on the note of raids. Crota's End is hard, and they're deliberately trying to do that so that they can see how far they can dial the knob to make the difficulty of the final shape raid just that much better, and to put it in an ideal place for that final conclusion to the Destiny saga. So, Next up, we need to talk about episodes, and this is a big change to the live service and narrative delivery portion of Destiny. So what are episodes? Well, they're not the same as the expansions like Warmind and Curse of Osiris, and they're not the same as Seasons. I think the way that people are seeing it at this moment in time is kind of a combination of both. Let me explain the structure. So every year, instead of four seasons, you get three episodes. The episodes each last about 18 weeks, and then they have a bunch of content that drops within them. Each episode will have three acts, and each of them drops over six weeks. So in total, that means nine acts worth of stuff. Each act is going to drop new seasonal content, new weapons, new armor, potentially new missions, and definitely new story stuff. So the narrative evolves over every six weeks, and it allows Bungie to really tap into some of those narratives on a weird and changing basis as they go. Six weeks between content deliveries is a really ambitious schedule, and it means that we're going to be getting story content a lot. I think Bungie is looking at this as a means of bridging the gap between what seasons do currently and what the old expansions did back in the day. Is this going to work? I don't know. Hypothetically, this is perfect as far as being the answer to people who hate seasons and the answer to people who also hate the expansions from back in the day. I don't know why I've been seeing so much nostalgia for Warmind recently, but I need to remind people that from a story perspective, Warmind was no disrespect to anyone over at Vicarious Visions who wrote this, but Warmind was I don't think it was good. I think a lot of the community that's really into the lore and the story did not like Warmind that much. You know, we had Whisper and that was a a really bright light on the horizon ahead of Forsaken and uh, yeah, that was kind of it. Um, we, you don't, we don't want to go back to that. But equally, 
There are people who disagree with me vehemently on the idea that seasonal story content is the way to go with this. I know there are people who despise the one story episode every week kind of format that Destiny has. I personally think it's fine, but there's enough people out there who disagree with me for me to know that it's a problem. Hopefully, this will be the answer to all of it. We get into that three-act narrative every six weeks, and every single time we get the ability to explore something new. Bungie has relayed the idea that this allows them to pivot on a dime, respond to community feedback, and potentially throw out more curveballs and experiment a little bit more, and it's a little bit less of a cost. This means that if we do want to get something in new seasons and we have some particularly focused feedback, we can throw it out there. It means that they can put new ideas in and it means they can experiment. Anyway, for all of the merits that that does have, there are some things we do definitively know, which is that the first few episodes are called Echoes, Revenant, and Heresy. Those are the first three, and again, each of these three episodes has three act narratives, each of them over six weeks. So that's nine total acts within the entirety of the year. It also looks like these episodes are going to focus first on the Vex, secondly on the Scorn, including the fanatic Fickrel, and lastly on the Hive. What that will all entail, I don't know, but I'm sure we'll find out as time goes on. I think that overall it gives me some confidence, but it's also completely untested. We're going to need to see how this does. It's going to need some testing, and it will need some iteration and changing, but Destiny is in that place where it's been doing the live service thing for a much longer time than a lot of other places. The one thing that people may dispute with me on this one, but I will remind them that it is nonetheless objectively true, is that Bungie has gotten very good at live service programming. I know there are people who absolutely despise the way that content is delivered in this game, but there's no question that as far as live services go, Destiny does it quite well. There are other live services out there that struggle to put content out in the first place. So, let's be really clear, we're in a better position than a lot of people. More importantly than that though, it's about refining the way that seasons work, and it's about refining how these episodes deliver content so that it always feels fresh. Finding that balance is what's really important. Will they deliver that? I don't know. But honestly, this kind of formatting makes me feel hopeful. I'd thought of something similar to this, where things could be a little bit more focused every single year, on my own, independently as well. And I wondered what would happen if we only had three seasons every year instead of four. And it seems like Bungie has had the same idea, and I imagine a bunch of other players have too. So it's just one of these moments at which you sit there and you think, well, hey, they've probably been able to iterate on this idea a whole lot behind the scenes and see what happens. Maybe that means it's going to do really well. I don't know, but we'll see. If someone is in a good position to experiment with this particular side of things, it's definitely Bungie. With all of that being said, though, I need to give my final thoughts on the showcase. What do I think of Season of the Witch? I think it looks awesome. I'm really excited. I'm going to dive in the moment I'm done with this video. What do I think of Final Shape? I am cautiously optimistic, but definitely more emphasis on the word caution than optimistic. I think if we're really looking at everything that we've experienced thus far, Bungie is willing to show us that, yeah, they learned from what they did in Lightfall, but it's also one of these strange moments at which the community's trust has been broken so repeatedly that people are waiting for Bungie to continue to prove them wrong. And I don't think they said anything, at least narratively, that is a huge red flag, except for the last little bit about, you know, you don't need to play the raid to get the final story. It's entirely possible that that's being interpreted incorrectly, and it is the case that it's just like, hey, it's about making sure the final beat of the story is accessible to everyone, and that the raid is realistically about popping off into that final beat. I don't know. The point is, I think if we're looking at what Final Shape is, it has the foundations laid to be a good story. And it has the foundations laid to be a good conclusion to the Light and Dark Saga. But we need to see it actually get there. We need Season of the Witch and the final season before it to deliver us a great narrative that leads into the final shape. 
We need it to be a moment in time where we can rebuild the confidence of the community in the live service and narrative portions of the game. And, most importantly of all, it needs to land. It's got to land properly. There are lots of indications that it might do it. And I'm really hopeful. Honestly, I am hopeful. But there is an incredibly tall task to make happen here. And it's only been made worse by what happened in Lightfall and by the expectations that people have set now. So, yeah, I don't know where we go from here. I am cautiously optimistic. I think I just want Bungie to prove me right now. Does that make sense? I hope it does. There are other really good things in here. I mentioned timeline reflections a whole bunch, and, you know, there are other little bits and pieces which we can speculate on in the future. The other really big question, I think, comes down to what happens after those three episodes. What happens after Echoes, Revenant, and Heresy? Bungie didn't talk about a next expansion after Final Shape. I think that that's deliberate, and I think if they do announce something, it won't take long. But I imagine that the big ending to whatever's going on in Final Shape is going to be what prompts them to release any information about what happens next. All that being said, that's all from me for now. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave a like, do all the algorithm things. Leave me your thoughts in the comments down below, because I'm not sure where I stand on this. I'd love to get everyone else's consensus and really feel out where the community is, because right now we're in very uncharted waters. Anyway, all things being said, as per usual, know that your viewership as always has been quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Brodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.